This is Leave Your Mark. I'm Vince Cortez, and today's guest is Chris Gather. He recounts his journey from first alarming symptoms to a devastating brain cancer with piercing headaches and vision problems. He's faced unimaginable pain, but has found a path to resilience and hope. Thank you for being my guest, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Hi there, and welcome. Now it's time for America's favorite podcast, Leave Your Mark, with your host, Vince Cortez. If it's fly, loose fit it, it's Cortez. If freeze and shovels in it, it's Cortez. Leave Your Mark is about inspiring the world, one guess at a time. Pass the word from Brooklyn to Pittsburgh, from urban to suburb, it's Cortez, you heard? And here is our host, Vince Cortez. Now, we're going to claim you. We got a lot of love over here, and we want to share some with you. So you Thank moved you. up after the age of seven, and you moved to Simsbury, Connecticut. You have a pretty rough life in your childhood. You're an only child, primarily raised by your mom. Share a little about your childhood. Absolutely. The brightest of starts. There were three divorces I witnessed before 18. You know, my mom, while she did the absolute best she could, she also dealt with some mental health challenges, anxiety and trauma-centered depression throughout her life. I became sort of a, a primary caretaker uh, in the home and oftentimes witnessed things that were either violent or, you know, alcohol-centered. We had a couple of alcoholics in the ex-husband column. And abandonment issues. I no longer speak to any of the people that, that took, took that position of father figures. A couple of them have passed away. That was extremely tough as a child to witness and try to survive. I carried that survival mindset into my adult life. Um, now, you're in Connecticut touching on your teenage years. Life at home was rough. Um, how big of a difference then when you go to school is it from what life is like at home? Life at school was a place that, you know, I tried to grab a lot of attention. I was a class clown and an instigator of fun. Well, uh, you, I mastered that art in high school, and I'm not sure that a lot of teachers appreciate that, <laughs> that type of art form. I did my best to get attention good from my classmates, bad from the administration. Looking back, I had headwinds. My grades weren't where they should have been. I was a solid B-minus student for most of high school and skated through. Oh, you were a tennis player and soccer, so you played in the activities, and mm -hmm. you said that you were also interested in politics in your high school days. So share with me the interest in those things. Uh, at that time... It wasn't a big interest for most students, but I was fascinated. We were coming off the Reagan years. It was a period where lively discussions started between Republicans and Democrats. I was fascinated by debate and being able to, you know, show my point of view and listen to other point of view and argue things out. And there used to be a more civil discourse where people could speak their minds and try to prove their points or steer opinions. So I got a lot of adrenaline out of that. I enjoyed that healthy debate. You end up graduating high school from Simsbury and you go on to Yukon. So you're staying in the northeastern part of the country and you leave school after one year. What's going on? I graduated my first year with a 0.8 GPA. I was not invited back to UConn. My mom was going through her third uh, divorce, dealing with a lot of depression. And my mind and I just were not on the ball. You know, I was partying, trying to blow off steam, and I escaped a lot of classes. I didn't look at my books. I was struggling. You know, there, there were periods of time that were very dark for me in that year after high school. All my friends had gone off. I, I was at a local campus of UConn, still at home, playing caretaker while trying to balance studies. It was a very unsuccessful combination. What's interesting is you reference yourself as a caregiver. At what point did that mechanism turn on in you, in your life, that you need to take care of your mom? Pretty early. I would say nine, ten years old, I started to really become that role, she had started to exhibit 
some issues from a ment- mental health standpoint. I was the jester trying to cheer uh-huh. her up. Make her happy. Help her writing her notes and taking care of, you know, if I felt that she was down, being supportive. But you don't realize at that age, that's not our responsibility, but you start to absorb that as your identity to become a caretaker, to put other people's needs mm. before your own. Wow. And so Hum- Human instinct. Because I mean, really, yeah. we're not even an inkling of worldly or truly in our uh, innocence at that age, you're suggesting, and to be of the mindset that someone was in need of help and to be that person is enormous. I mean, a transition in life, some people never experience, really. No, they and lost in themselves. At this point, you can see how things would be taxing on you to actually try to experience life on your own, you know, figure it out. And while well, you're in what it's just got to be crazy, almost successful like thoughts going through your mind. This is amazing yeah. for you to rise up out of this. So you end up going then, her mom's advice, to the Hartford. So Connecticut, she's following your caregiving and you're following her advice. So there's some communication going here and you end up working your way through the ranks in the insurance industry. Yeah. Yeah. Life begins to take root for you now. How many insurance companies do you go through until you arrive at meeting your wife, Nancy? I worked at Hartford for three years in the mailroom instead of college. I looked at it as real life college where I understood the inner workings of a corporation, was really uh, spending a lot of time observing management and, and people that were around trying to understand the process. It was real life studying. And from there, I moved to Travelers. I met Nancy, my wife. We were both with other people, but that was my first interactions with her. I moved to LA for a couple of years to sales work. 9-11 happened. I moved Ooh. back to Connecticut to be closer to family and friends because everything shifted from a perspective standpoint. And we were both done with relationships. We started to date. Ready to start your own journey? Watch Leave Your Mark podcast mini course on YouTube today. Discover powerful insights, real stories, and tips to unleash your potential. Don't wait. Take action now. Start making your mark. Click the link in the description below to watch the mini course. And now, now you're married for 15 years. You end up having two children with Brooke and Ella. You find out that you have cancer. Share with me what life is like up to the point when, when you, you find out something's wrong. Having children and Nancy by my side was excellent. A great foundational piece. I was able to heal a lot of old wounds from having stability. I, I started to do a lot of work on myself. Before that, I was trying to get answers and I was very introspective, which I think a lot of people start their journeys you yeah. know, to good well, mental. How many years before meeting Nancy were you by yourself? So you had a lot to sort out based on what happened when you were young. In your 20s, early 30s, we think we got it all together. It's like we're still just babes in the woods. I, I had some girlfriends. I always gravitated to longer-term girlfriends. I had relationships that didn't work out. During those, I started therapy, trying okay. to figure things out. The, there, there were a lot of trust issues. You can imagine if you have your primary caretaker where things were not necessarily stable. No. You saw failed marriages, violent alcoholism. You were abandoned. It leaves you with major trust issues, a shadow that follows you around. I did some surfacy therapy, talk therapy. That's an amazing starting point. To speak to a professional to get things out. You don't even realize you're caring. I remember the first therapy session I went into the therapist ended after I told my story with saying, well, I just want to applaud you on the fact that you're alive. You're not in jail, on drugs, an alcoholic yeah. or an abuser, because that is what you were destined to become. I was on the edge and things could have bounced either way. Right. Um, 
I'm a big believer in fortuitous timing to certain relationships and things happening in our lives that steer us. It's not all under our control. I had some guardian angels that looked out for me and steered me out of dangerous situations. I did put in the work. And to say it's uncomfortable is an understatement. It's brutal to go back and dig through things. When Nancy and I got married, I spent a lot of time either introspectively or through counseling, understanding what that pain had done to me and the behaviors I wanted to let go and releasing a lot of emotions that I'd been carrying around, the jaded relationships. And so it's a lot. The weight of those being removed when you found that inner strength to do it one time, you realize you have the mental capacity to overcome. Mm -hmm. This leads into your situation with cancer. So you dealt yes. with it in a survival mode on a different level when you're youth and now on a physical level as an adult, you're tested mentally in this category. This can help. And I enjoy watching your Instagram and I see you have a podcast. It's all very encouraging because you are so personable and so authentic that you have a, an incredible ability to share the tenderness of the thoughts and the delicacy of what those thoughts mean. Thank and, you. and and how that actually heals. For that reason, I was like, we got to get this guy on here and people need to hear his voice because he has a lot to offer. So thank you. You find out you have cancer. Well, what are you thinking? You have a um, wife, kids, your life in order. You go as far as saying at 47, I feel like I got life all figured out and yeah. you get the rug pulled out from under you. Just like anybody who receives a, a cancer diagnosis, especially with a vital organ like the brain, you figure you're done. It's time to go. It's been a nice run. I truly thought I had two years because I worked in the insurance business. I'm familiar with glioblastomas. I didn't know what type of tumor it was right off the bat. The biggest thing that hit me was I cannot believe I'm leaving my daughters behind without mm. a father, right? This was devastating to me. This was the one thing I wanted to get right. I didn't want to leave them fatherless. That hit me right in the gut. It was heartbreaking. From there, I started to think, well, if I've got two years and now I've been hit with this mortality recognition, what can I do over the next two years? I can't change the past. I could live in regret about wasted time or say, I've been given a time clock. And if I ignore it and I'm sitting on the same bed in two years and I didn't do what I wanted to do, which is create a, a meaningful purpose, shame on me. I, I can't sit in that bed in two years if I didn't do what I, I needed to do and blame anybody but myself. I made it a mission to make a change immediately. When you get a cancer diagnosis, you realize how little most things matter. Yeah. It is instantly stripped away. There was a strong sense of relief because I could put down my nuisance thoughts, my negative doom and gloom about what's coming at work, what's going to happen with this, all the day-to-day -day stuff. I finally understood it didn't matter. It macro. What were the macro things I needed to get right? I needed to love bigger, be more open, more vulnerable, share my wisdom and heart with the world. If I didn't, it would not be a life well lived. That was my goal on that bed when I heard that diagnosis, is that I needed to make immediate changes. And only until I heard the words brain cancer, only when I heard those words could I understand None of that mattered. You can tell people they don't matter, right? The that 95% of the thinking that goes on day to day, you can sit on my page all day and say, on your deathbed, none of that will matter. If you haven't faced cancer or some type of chronic illness, it won't make sense. Our brain is wired to survive. Nobody understands mortality till they're faced with them. There's a lot of truth in that. So when do you decide to start treatment on this? I knew that the tumor was four centimeters. I knew 
And my wife knew that it had to be taken care of immediately because it was causing seizures. And that's how these are diagnosed, is that they trigger a seizure of some sort. Mine were vision seizures. So I had this white flashing light that appeared on the left side of my vision peripherally, piercing headaches for a couple of days. And I was fortunate to have that. And then we went up to Brigham and Women's up in Boston and got, it was a 12 hour surgery Mm. uh, to remove, you know, this four centimeter tumor that they think was in there for seven to 10 years. Thank goodness it was slow growing good prognosis. And, you know, my recovery, luckily I didn't have to go through radiation or chemotherapy, but there was a targeted therapy used as off-label treatment that was used for AML patients that were late stage. Now, uh, is that in a form of a laser or an IV or how is that administered? I take two pills a day. What's Um, in a capsule? Limited side effects. Their philosophy with these low-grade gliomas has changed. They used to throw everything at it as cancer patients. The goal is to administer the least aggressive medication up front that you have to, right? And because cancer has a way of aggressively reacting to what you fight it with, right? So if you come in like a lamb and still push the time frame out, that's the ultimate goal from an oncology standpoint. The yeah. last thing we want to do is attack a low-grade something with hardcore chemo radiation if you don't have to. I was fortunate to have something available to me. Generally, I found the medical side was, would err over medicating. This is more finesse. Too much is not a good thing. We need to hit this on the right spot. What is your biggest challenge now with your condition? You got 98% of this tumor removed. You passed your two years. The initial diagnosis, you're truly in the best mental space you can be. I enjoy listening to you. You found the sweet spot in your mental health now. I wrote my book and started Leader Mark Podcast to share my story of battling cancer. Not just for me, but for anyone facing their own struggles. I wanted people to know that no matter how tough life gets, there's always hope and strength within us. My mission is to inspire others to tap into that power and leave their mark on this world. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm almost up on four years. They try to dial back aggressive treatments because brain cancer patients know There are microcells that exist. You can't do a full resection of a brain tumor. Um, There are always microcells that remain. My surgeon told me a millimeter matters. You can't take margins in the brain, right? Because once you start taking margins, you start taking vital brain matter uh, and connections and causing deficits. They would rather leave more in and have somebody not have deficits than take too much out and leave somebody impaired. Yeah. To answer your question in regards to the biggest challenge, it's twofold. One, understanding that those microcells exist, that this is a lifetime journey. There is a strong benefit to that, Vince. I have to go in for quarterly scans, as a lot of cancer patients need to do. I look at those as guideposts, checkpoints. I can't get too far off track. If I get cocky and start not appreciating the people I have around me, I'd, I'd get reminded of it as I'm walking into the MRI. I found the light in the MRI. It's a reminder to live. To anybody who has to do MRIs, one trick that I have, I think, you know, trained my brain to feel is that life doesn't end with the results, right? Just because you get a bad result does not necessarily mean your life is over. You don't get the plug pulled that day. You still have life to live. And there's always another option as far as treatment for the most part. I don't want to be insensitive, Mm. but just know it is a guidepost for us to live. As far as where do I go from here? My therapy journey has stepped up over the last six months to a much deeper level. I've been doing EMDR therapy, digging deeper into the emotional brain where pain and unprocessed trauma is stored. Two books convinced me the myth of normal by Dr. Gabor Mate uh, and the body keeps the score. 
by Bessel van Kolk. And those two books really changed my view on things. After my diagnosis and surgery, talking about looking at things in a brighter light, going from dark to light, being strong and resilient. For the first year after surgery, I will, living in the moment was the only way. As I started to truly recover, I started to have these invasive thoughts again, these habitual, nagging, anxious thoughts. I would find myself exhausted by 11 in the morning and having to pound mm. coffee all day. And I started to think like, where did these come from? As I started to read about brain circuitry and the way that we are wired and all of this neuro circuitry and how just because we necessarily talk things out, this circuitry still exists. And until you can find a mechanism to rewire things mm -hmm. and to really change the way that when we receive stimuli from either relationships or things that occur in our life, they're all going to be fed through that old circuitry. If we're leaning towards fight or flight, things are going to trigger us that we have no understanding of the actual a genesis of where these things reside. And so to me, this EMDR therapy, and it's not for everyone, I'm not claiming to be an expert on it. I just know that I have been able to recognize things because of we've activated the emotional brain and gotten the logical brain that used to try to figure all my stuff out, which mm -hmm. leads to treadmill thinking. It opened up and allowed me to feel for the first time in my life, things that have been trapped in me. And I am a believer, after reading especially the myth of normal, that unprocessed trauma manifests in chronic conditions, cancer, autoimmune disorders, right? What do we blame autoimmune disorders on food supply? Yet, if we look at the fact that I know a bunch of people that don't have autoimmune disorders, but still eat the same food supply, you know, that's a very simplistic way to look yeah. at it. But the people I know who have autoimmune disorders also have very deep internalized trauma that they mm. haven't dealt with. I want to ask and you a question. When I had cancer, I read a book from a doctor. He was out of Germany, and he mentions that we all cause our own cancer. Based on my experience, your story resonates because you realize how yes. little control you have, but you control the most important thing. You have a choice in those thoughts. It, disregarding how confusing, like what you saw as a child, do you think we cause all our own cancer? No, but I think it's a byproduct of unresolved trauma and pain. I do. I, I think... It's an ingredient. I, I don't want to blame myself for my cancer. I don't want to say it's my fault. But if we don't deal with what is harming us internally, it manifests with adrenaline, cortisol, inflammation. Mm. If we don't take it as severe as cancer, look at the common cold. Mm. Everybody will say, oh, I'm so run down mentally. You know, I've been at work long hours. I've been taking care of myself. I haven't been getting sleep. Everyone's okay with saying that caused your cold. You need more rest and relaxation. Mm -hmm. But if somebody says cancer ca is caused by chronic stress, anxiety, depression. A lot of Western medicine and people are not correlating those. If you're having all these things that keep going, eventually it is going to manifest itself mm -hmm. in a chronic condition, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the genetic code. If we have mutations in our genetic code and a properly formed immune system, our immune system can recognize these early threats and take care of them. It's when the immune system starts to lose track of it and the cancer mm. starts to get smarter and work mm -hmm. around it. My point being, I am not an oncologist. When I ask an oncologist about the cause, they'll say, we don't know yet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We could say it's sugar, right? We could say yeah, There's a lot of things you can point at. I, right. I, mine was like, what is my self-talk like? Did I like myself the most? You know, it's easy right. to like other people and be of service to others. What about your service to yourself? What about when you're alone? How, how are you talking to yourself? All of those things you mentioned weigh in as ingredients if my mental health is not in the right place.
I can either fall off the cliff or I soar off the mountaintop. What am I going to do? We have that choice. There's incredible strength in your story. What are you continuing to do now to stay on top of your situation? What's your health regime, your rest, diet, time mm -hmm. with your family? What's going on in this part of your life at this point, being four years plus? Mental health stems from self-care. There's some rhetoric out there that talks about we're such a selfish society that looks to me. I would agree that if it's um, from an ego perspective, yes. But if it is simply building a foundation of emotional well-being, by getting therapy, talking with friends, connecting, co-regulating, being with people that bring you energy instead of detracting your energy, listening to the words that you say to yourself, a lot of thinking is out of our control and it's emotionally based. What I've seen since I've gone through this therapy that taps into the emotional side of my brain, there were some strongly held belief systems that even though I tried to think positively, I could never get there. Now I believe that I'm worthy of love, that I'm worthy mm -hmm. of compassion, not from just others, but from myself. There's a lot of self-resentment, anger, and bitterness mm -hmm. when our identity focuses on others and we feel like failures. To get to that point, there has to be work done. I am currently working on it and I recommend it. The foundation starts with our mental health. Exercise is key. There's a great book, Spark, by Dr. John Rady, about the physiological effects of exercise. And... They're great. It, you can take somebody with ADHD, low-grade anxiety, put them on a workout program of just moderate exercise every day, and all of a sudden, all those symptoms start disappearing. It is not joke science. This is just our brains were built with natural pharmacies, right? It's how we utilize them. That's my focus. My diet has gotten better. I walk consistently with my dogs, thank God for them. They get me out on it's rainy days time. or whatever. Walks yeah. are really good for you. What if you had nothing that stood in your way to the dream life you always wanted? Invincible coaching. Learn how you can have this. Click the link below. What is the best compliment you've ever received? That I'm kind and caring. That's me. I, that's what I want to be. The emotion I want to give people. We're from Pittsburgh. I was raised on Mr. Rogers, a fellow Pittsburgh mm -hmm. gentleman. And so I, I loved his slow, let's care about each other, regardless of sex, race, let's show we care about each other. To me, that was ingrained in me. You embody his characteristics very well. Thank you. you That's could, a huge you could, compliment. You can yeah. see the influence. How would you like to leave your mark? I would like to leave my mark at someone who battled the darkness and provided light to the world. Somebody that had every reason to give up. There are tons of excuses why I could have just packed it in. I had a vision when I was younger to help others, but that I wanted to make a difference in the world. And I needed to heal a lot before I felt confident enough to do that. And I think the world needs a lot of people to be more open, to be more vulnerable, to share, because it helps others and ourselves feel less alone, mm -hmm. right? To me, the difference I want to make to go through the dark and share your light, but also be open and vulnerable. If I could help one person a day, through one of my mm. posts, know that I've changed their trajectory of their day in some fashion, and maybe they went and made a therapy appointment, or maybe they have that tough conversation with somebody to apologize or heal a wound with someone or within themselves. Mm. My job is done here. It's incredibly powerful what you just said in the most minute thing where the greatest power exists. Yeah. Just one small thought of one individual. When we tie ourselves together emotionally as a community, the idea of how powerful we are, you don't have any idea until you're tested. 
Right. When you're right. tested, that's like Nelson Mandela. We're not scared of the dark. We're scared of the bright. We terrify ourselves. You got that much in you. You exhibit that very well by your post, the content you're sharing. So, so I want that. listeners to get access to you, share where we can find your content. Let yeah. us get the, the folks over to have a conversation with you. You can help with mental health for sure. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm over on, I'm on Instagram. Right now is my main platform. It's under culmination point. We've got a, a fantastic community. I did not expect much when I started posting. You know, it was really one of those, I'm going to make a fool of myself and just share. I remember walking down the street, holding my phone, thinking, yeah, I'd put it down as soon as a car would go by or, you know, anybody would be walking by. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this guy's crazy. I kept thinking that. And, uh, and then I started to see people reacting to it, the vulnerability and openness. We're up to 21,000 people that adore. I think people are hungry for this. People are hungry for connection, especially with social media. I love what you're doing. I, I love the fact that you have guests sharing their stories. We need more of this. The, the more people talk about the brightest parts of their life, the more, you know, people's, you know, that are watching it, they feel inferior and they feel like I'm a failure. I would love if social media was more about honesty, about mm -hmm. the fact that right after that they left that sunny vacation, they had a, an event that occurred and they have to take time off or right? share everything. If you're going to share the beautiful, share the messy, because that's life. Life is messy. There's no doubt about it. It's only yeah. till it's over. Do you see the beauty in it after it's gone? Yes. And this is yes. an incredible time for us to have this communication, to be on the internet and share these awesome. stories. As you said, I get more empowered off each one. We're all fingerprint. And yes. dress, stress and struggles differently create incredible sports dramas and in the television and the pregame hype and all this. It's like, that's not really that important. What's important <laughs> is what you and I are sharing today. Yeah. The idea of bragging on these moments. You know, yeah. he had a wife, kids, cancer, and got it done. That's a highlight yeah. reel. Thank you Plus. for participating. Yeah. You got that fighting spirit. These are the moments that make life worth living. And I appreciate you sharing your story. Oh, it's my pleasure. I appreciate what you're doing, giving us a platform to discuss these things. This is what life's all about. There's one last thing I'd like to say. I saw this clip talking about a hundred years from now, after we all pass, our children might not be here. We're talking about great grandparents. Think about how many times somebody has said, great grandpa Joe or great grandpa Emily, our own families don't remember our history in a hundred yeah. years. The meaning to me is, does it really matter what we're worried about? If you can impact somebody today, that, that's really all we have. Think in terms of now, what can you do? Can you be nice to a stranger? Can you help somebody that needs help? Volunteer at a soup kitchen or church or synagogue or whatever you believe in it's about lifting each other up and that's the message because that pebble in the water effect is what life is all about and we'll move on forever whether or not we're here ever you just left your mark thanks for listening, thanks for listening. listen to more episodes on demand just click leave your mark with vince cortez what an incredible story how Chris is standing up to his brain cancer. If you enjoyed it, you will surely enjoy this next battle with cancer story. Click the link.